Hello. Hi, hi everyone. Hi everybody. Hi, hi. Hi, we love. Hi. Okay. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in to our live feed, uh, live broadcast for uh, the essentials of travel photography. Uh, this is hosted by Fuji Firm. So um, thank you everybody for actually coming online to listen to us. Uh, there's Joseph. And uh, myself, William, uh, sharing with you a bit about travel photography and wildlife photography. Um, yeah. So, hope oh, everybody is doing fine. And uh, so, Joseph, how are you? Have not yes. uh, we? I probably we have not been out for quite a while. Yeah. So I've been like grounded here uh, until end of December. So it's like it's a good um, six months or even I mean about nine months. Yeah, in Singapore right now. So, uh, how about you? Uh, it's been pretty bad actually. I have to cancel quite a number of trips. Then, uh, the I still have some trips uh, towards the later part of the year, the second part of the year. I just hope that everything is uh, going to be fine and uh, I can still go on my trips. Uh, don't know when this will end. Yeah. Yeah, right now is like the situation is like is quite unknown uh, to us, especially for us uh, travel photographers. Everyone is like grounded, right? Right, uh, like actually, I'm supposed to be in uh, Japan right now. Yeah, but uh, the trip is like uh, cancelled. So it's like all right. So I got no income right now. <laughs> so I have to um, make some income. Yeah. So I'm just trying to like figure out some ways and means to do so mostly it's like probably we'll conduct some workshops and uh, maybe online workshops and stuff like that during this yeah. season yeah. yeah so yeah. yeah so it's like uh where, where's your where's the next place that you're going to go i mean once the uh covid is over okay actually this week i'm supposed to be in china but of course uh trip has been cancelled so um uh i still have an africa trip uh uh, uh q3 of this year so hopefully that everything is fine, uh, that uh, we can still go on our trips. And uh, yeah, but uh, uh, if there's one trip that I really like to go, but else all this, all this uh, COVID-19 is resolved, I would love to go Antarctica, which I know you have been there a few times already. So uh, yeah, that's probably one of the places I really wanted to go that I've not really covered yet. And understand that the best time to go is actually from December to February, right? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, correct. So it's like from December, actually it's uh, from November, mid of November mm. to end of, uh, to mid of March. Actually, that's the season. Yeah, I've been there like um, about five, four times actually. So actually next year I'll be going there again. But right now the situation is really unknown. Uh, I'm not so sure that if the, tour is going to proceed so right now uh, yeah, i'm also waiting for confirmation as well okay. yeah it's like uh antarctica is like very wonderful place it's like it's uh a really kind of a surreal and it's, it's totally different from the rest of the rest of the world i think you should go there one day yeah for sure i i really hope to go there one day <laughs> yeah. Join. yeah we, we, we can yeah. just go together yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And just go yeah. together yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, it's really definitely one of those places I wanted to go. So yeah, yeah maybe uh maybe you can also share with us uh, uh some pictures from Antarctica and also share with us your some of your 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 insights and uh thoughts about travel photography. I'm sure a lot of people who join us uh, uh live tonight is uh, they want to know more about travel photography because maybe both of us our genre of travel photography our style of travel photography is quite different. So, uh, of course, there are different genres, uh, landscape, wildlife, uh, streets, and things like that. But of course, um, I think we will touch less on street tonight because uh, our fellow ex photographers has talked a lot about street photography last week. So, yeah, maybe we can share with them our our insights on travel photography. Yeah. Yeah, Anything sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. So like, uh, okay, let me talk about a little bit on my style and also, and then maybe I will cover a little bit on uh, some like Antarctica or even like wildlife or even my mm -hmm. uh, kind of like travel photos. All right. So my, my style is actually quite straightforward. I like to take pictures that is very simple and mm -hmm. straight to the point. 
that is um, generally that is my style of photography. Uh, I like to show the uh, places, the sense of places. I mean, it's like uh, I like to show straight away that one one look at it, you know that this is the place that oh, or this is Tanzania, or probably like this is Antarctica. So, and in the picture itself, the photo itself, you do not need to actually uh, talk too much on wordings. So a lot of people, they, when they post on social media, Facebook or Instagram, they would like to actually write a lot of words and describe a lot. Yeah, yeah. but for me, a, photo, a good photo is actually straight away, when you look at the picture, you already know the place. You do not need to talk so much. Yeah. So it's I mean, like a picture place a thousand words. Ah uh, yes, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So basically, that's the that's my style. I mean, straight. I give you a punch, and I I just tell you that this is the thing. Uh, yeah. Maybe I just show some of my pictures, and maybe you can talk a little bit on that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So so for our viewers who are watching live right now, do feel free to ask any questions to us. Uh, you know anything about travel photography, the countries you have been to, uh, equipment maybe or whatever. Just feel free to ask any questions. We'll try our best to answer your questions. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, don't be shy. And uh, we are here to to have a casual talk with everybody. Yeah, yeah. correct. So because we can uh, talk, but the thing is that uh, we cannot uh, hear you talking. And this is my first time actually doing this kind of like live uh, feed. It's a bit strange because I cannot see the expression of the viewers, you know. And it's like I'm just looking at the camera itself. And and the, and William and me basically that's that's all. So I hope that y'all can just type in your comments and some of the questions that you might have. Maybe say, uh, okay, I'm going to uh, maybe say Paris next month or oh, not. Oh, sorry, not next month, next year. <laughs> <laughs> so next next month is not possible. Yeah. So it's like so. What what are the things that uh, you can give me? What are the suggestions or what are the tips and how how can I shoot and stuff like that? So yeah, we can actually uh tell tell you more about all these kind of like tips and pointers during our live session here right now. Yeah, I'm sure between Joseph and myself, um, uh, well, we wouldn't say that we have traveled the most, but I think we have traveled between us to quite a fair bit of places, fair amount of time. So uh, yeah, probably we can advise you guys a bit more about uh, all those travel photography, all those things that you see online, whether his pictures or my pictures or uh, any other people's uh, pictures you know there are always a lot of questions that you might have do feel free to ask us yeah right yeah so just keep the comments coming in right now it's like so that we can actually uh see what is the most important things that we can we should talk about yeah, yeah. right now <laughs> okay. we, we, are, we really don't know what are the uh common questions that you probably have so it's like we just talk like uh on, on my side it's like i think that this is quite important yeah, so uh, I will just talk about that. Yeah, but there are some questions that we, we, we will not know, you see, right? So maybe some of the questions that I have from the viewers, most of the time people ask me, so what is inside your bag? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, i tell you that what are the things that uh, I always bring uh, during the trip. So yeah, maybe I will just share with you. And after maybe William can share what is in his bag as well, yeah, yeah. right? So for me, I have um, I, normally I bring everything out, everything. So <laughs> sorry. So for me is if I need to shoot it, I will need to have that lens. I need to have that camera to actually work. So for me, it's working. I have like uh, 1635. I have uh, I mean, I will talk about DSLR. I mean, uh, on a full, I mean, a full frame kind of lens. Okay, so it's in wide angle, sixteen thirty five. I have like twenty four seventy, seventy two hundred, or even hundred four hundred, and also prime lens like the um, thirty five, fifty, hundred. Yeah. So I I bring almost everything out, and of course filters as well and tripod. Sometimes I bring one tripod and sometimes I bring two tripods. It depends on that location. So it's like every time I, I go out, my bag is always 30 kg. Even for five days, also 30 kg. How about you? <laughs> I mean, do you have the same problem? Well, I, of course these days, um, uh, uh, thankfully, I switched to Fuji uh, about five, six years ago already. So uh, my equipment list, 
though there's still a lot of things, but it became lighter because of the mirrorless cameras. And uh, in fact, I just had a question coming in asking me, is it tough to travel with a GFX? Um, yes, I travel with a GFX 100. Uh, well, yes, it's heavier than my ST3, definitely. But um, I'm so used to DSLRs in the past. I find that GFX is actually nothing, you know, it's quite light. And uh, I do bring a lot of equipment like Joseph as well. Um, I, I bring a host of wide angles, long lenses and stuff like that. So again, depends on where I'm going. If I'm going to shoot the Northern Lights, yes, I, I do bring like three tripods as well. Um, uh, if I go shoot wildlife, I go bring more long lenses. If it's just going to be a European trip, then maybe just one, you know, 100, 400 would do. So it also depends on where I'm going, like what Joseph has mentioned. So, um, uh, but it's definitely not like my hand carry is always heavy. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Joseph, there's one question to both of us, actually. Yes. <laughs> Why do you choose GFS to shoot landscapes? Okay. Um, so I think I, I just joined uh, Fujifilm as a as photographer just about one year ago. Yeah, I think about one year. But I've been using Fuji for about two years. So it's generally for me, I'm actually quite new to Fuji. But when I, uh, the reason why I switched to Fuji is because of GFX. That's the first thing is GFX. Yeah, I, before before using GFX, I've been already shooting using a medium format style. So uh, that is, uh, I'm, I'm actually using a big tripod and I actually do like mirror lockup and all those stuff. So it's like, when you use a medium format, first thing is that you have to go a bit slower because of if a little bit of, especially the, the big megapixel, I mean, the huge megapixel, the 100 megapixel, you, you have to be very stable. So I've been practicing all these kind of uh, things beforehand already, before that. It's like, maybe it's like over the last four years or five years ago, I've been actually starting to actually stabilize myself when I should, I start to go slow rather than go fast. I don't uh, kind of like chomp. You know, and uh, go in and, and and shoot very fast. So I will just slowly take my time to actually look at things and then uh, put my tripod if that's the landscape, and then I will just start to shoot. So using a GFX, why I choose to use a GFX? First thing is the color. I like that color, the punch. If you know about the uh, old eras, uh, the 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 old uh, olden days, that that film era, so. In the film era, there is like negative, it's like the, uh, what's it called, the film, and also the slides. So using the medium format, is like you're shooting like a slide, and it's punch, there's a punch over there. But yeah. using a DSLR, it will be like, kind of like a negative. It's like the color, yes, it's nice, but the, there's no punch. The color doesn't just, doesn't come out. I mean, in terms of the separation of colors is very distinctive. If you see my recent work and the recent work, uh, let's say, I mean, the, on or the work that is like four, two years ago, mm -hmm. you can see a very distinctive between the color shift. Yeah. So okay. one of my friends actually uh, told me this. I was going to a lawyer firm. So my, my friend is a lawyer. So I went there. Of course, he charged me for that like, because I went there for a consultation. So he told me, say, hey, Joseph, I saw your recent photos. It's like, wow, it's very nice. I like it. I said, okay, well, it's not because I am improving or my skill is improving. But actually, in fact, it's the color. Uh, in fact, it's the camera that helps me. You know, it's a GFX. Because I, 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 tell him, I told him, say, I'm using a GFX right now. So that's why the color and the pictures looks softer. And then especially on the brocade itself because of the of the uh, sensor size and also the color, the uh, separation of colors. Yeah. So there's one one of the very key important thing that actually why what makes me uh, change to GFX is the color. I think image quality is really amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, colors wise, uh, with all the Fuji cameras, uh, you know the colors are always great, and uh, for GFX especially, the uh, image quality is something that. Like when I was conducting a quite a few workshops last time, I, I did mention to a lot of my participants and tell them that um, when you try it, you really got to see the difference in the image quality. 
And um, for me, uh, of course, the, why I want to use a GFS 100, I mean, I used to have a GFS 50, then I upgraded to the GFS 100. It's also because I, I do a lot of fine art prints. So I sell a lot of my prints as well, uh, uh, whether locally or, or there's a gallery in the States that repre represents me. So I do sell a lot of the prints and um, having a large mega pixel camera really makes a lot of difference. I can really print a lot bigger and the details are really amazing. So uh, I, I used to see a comment on Facebook before somebody actually asked, uh, is there anything that I cannot shoot with my normal camera that a GFX 100 can? I, I, I just tell them, I say, well, of course, you know, anything you can shoot with any camera, even an iPhone camera or whatever. Yes, but true. The, the, the difference is in the details. When you print it out, that's where you see a lot of difference. And, and as a photographer, I guess... Uh, our, our, we get excited, we really get very excited when we see our print and when we see it printed big and that's where, you know, it really makes a lot of difference. Of course, I will have to tell a lot of people, you know, hobbies and things like that, they might not want to print, you know, it's okay. But I guess as a photographer, that's where we really want uh, to see the details and the difference in the image when we do the print. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, correct. Th that's one of the reasons why I also uh, looking at image quality. I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of photographers or a lot of um, hobbies, they don't print. But once you start to print, then you will actually uh, see, wow, I think I need, this is very important. I need megapixel. I cannot crop. Because once you crop, you lose the megapixel, you cannot print. Big. <laughs> I mean, when I say print big, we're talking about not, not saying like A4 size paper, you know, or maybe say, uh, I mean, the A, A3 size. We're talking about one meter or two meters. So these yep. are the big prints that we're talking about. So yep. everything starts to enlarge. If you yep. just shoot and print on, uh, I mean, Facebook, well, you, you can't see even a little dot. There's no, no, no difference because I need to zoom in in order for me to see that. Uh, what's the call the problem area or the the uh, pixel itself that is not sharp or whatever. So yeah. right now it's like well when you do a two meters, wow, everything can be everything, all your all your problem start to enlarge <laughs> because bigger. <laughs> yeah. So so that that is the difference between why we have to use a good quality camera for a good image quality. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's that that's why a medium format comes in. So Definitely. right now, I actually saw some of the comments uh, coming in. It's like, do you spend much time on editing? And someone actually find it very taxing on editing. So how about, I mean, maybe you want to share about your okay. editing process? Why not? Why not? Yeah. Maybe we share some photos first. Then yeah. we, we talk about some of the other questions that they might have. A lot of questions are coming in. Very good. So guys, very good. I see a lot of questions coming in. Uh, we'll take our time to address all your questions and concerns. Uh, but uh, probably people will see a bit more photos. So maybe you can yeah. share some photos first and we we'll okay. see uh, how, how how it goes. Yeah. yeah, sure. So let me share about, let's say about two or three photos before we uh, change to William. And after that, then uh, we'll address some of your questions, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm actually using the Lightroom to, to share some of my photos right now. Okay, let me see. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is one of the photos that I took in China. Okay, uh, I'm talking about a bit of a cityscape. Yeah, Seta. Yes, you're right, it's Seta. So you see, one look, you know that is Seta. Correct, so that is my style of photography. One look, you know it's Seta. And of course, when I shoot my photos, uh, especially for cityscape or landscape photos, uh, there is a specific timing to it. I mean, for all the landscape uh, photographers, they will know. In uh, either you shoot in the early morning, or the late in the evening, sunset timing. So for this uh, shot itself, I'm actually doing it in the early morning, and mm -hmm. I do a bit of long exposure to actually let the crowd actually move. Yeah, so that's the thing. Right now in Serta is um, restricted right now. Yeah, I cannot so, do it. Really. <laughs> sorry, man. I, I I wish that I can bring you. I wish that I can bring you there, or even William would like to bring you there as well. But the thing is that right now is all blocked. Yeah. This shot is a very old photo. It's like taken in the I think 
2015 or something like that. Yeah. So it's like right now, it's like nobody can actually go there now. Right. So the, the so this is uh, one of the very priceless shot that I have. So I just want to share with uh, you over here, the cityscape. And okay, this is uh, Italy in uh, Cinque Terre. All right. So you see, I, the picture itself that I actually uh, should uh, for this scene itself is more on the composition. I like to have the wave, the houses, and also the uh, spectrum of the sunset. Actually, this is a sunset shot. So this this shot, a lot of people actually ask me, say, wow, how do you get that pink spectrum over there that, that looks uh, very nice? So I, I tell them that, Actually, it's the timing. The timing is the key. This shot is taken with about four minutes long exposure. So the cloud actually will pull it until uh, a very, uh, how to say, uh, until uh, slick, very slick. Yep. And the cloud itself is um, uh, very smooth and the water is also very smooth. The key thing is about timing. That timing is about seven, a crop, if I'm not wrong, and it was it's like almost no light at all. It's after the sunset, so a lot of people where they should they like to take sunset shot, which means that the sun is still up there. But for me, my sunset shot is actually after the sun has set. Yeah. So which means that I'm actually taking the spectrum. Yeah. I like spectrum more than the sunset shot itself. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, because why I don't take a sunset shot is because uh, especially when the sun is very strong, it's very harsh. And uh, it, it, it just doesn't give you that kind of uh, punch. And normally people take sunset shot, they want to take the egg yolk, you see. So with the egg yolk, you will have the flare that comes in. So that, that is why I always take spectrum shots. Yeah. Right. So how about William? Maybe you want to share some of your photos? Sure. Uh, okay, maybe I just share some photos. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, for me, I like to take photos that uh, maybe try to make it look a bit different. I, I, I guess nowadays, a lot of times when we travel, um, a lot of the places that we have been to, we have maybe seen the images from Google or whatever. And uh, so sometimes I always try to give it a slight twist to it, uh, be it a different perspective or, or a different angle to, to make it look a bit different uh, for some of the images so that uh, it make, make it look a bit interesting, so-called. Yeah, so maybe I just share a few images. Um, let's see. So this is um, see, this is taken in uh, this is taken in Turkey actually. Oh, wow. This is taken in Turkey, and um, it's um, well a lot of people go to Turkey and they take the standard um, uh, blue moss and you know the images you see on on on, on Google actually. Um, and, uh, <laughs> sorry. I say I am the I am actually I'm one of them that actually take the rumors and stuff like that. So I have to agree. <laughs> yeah. So so, yeah, so right. I was actually on the um, I was actually on the water where I shot this. I was actually on the on the boat. Yeah, I was actually on the boat. So I thought um, I saw the nice light coming down, and instead of just shooting the light and the moss, I saw the bridge on top of me. So I frame it nicely to to show a you know it's like two two images in a single frame to make it a little bit different and um, yeah, to make it a little bit exciting as well. Yeah, so this is what I always try to achieve in some of my images. And um, some other images that I have uh, uh, is also basically playing with perspective. So this is actually in Bhutan. Um, this is actually in Bhutan and, and this is in Bhutan Timpu. 
So a lot of people saw the image of the Buddha. This Buddha was only built uh, not too long ago. I cannot remember a year actually. But uh, a lot of people actually shot the Buddha when they are, you know, just below the Buddha or when they're climbing up and things like that. Uh, but I saw this image uh, um, at a far away place. I was using a 300mm lens to shoot this. So again, you know, it's, um, it was early morning, very foggy and things like that. And there was just a nice light illuminate the, illuminating the Buddha. So it's like a nice rim light on the Buddha. So I, I, I love this a lot. I call it heaven. So, you know, it's, um, it's just different and very nice. And uh, again, a black and white photo always makes a lot of difference to, to an image. So this is what I liked. Um, again, some people, yes, they recognize that this might be in Timpu, uh, uh, Bhutan. But again, it's probably not a common anger that they see usually. So, um, which goes back to my same ideology about bringing a lot of lenses like yourself, Joseph, because sometimes we never know what we might get. You know, so when I, use, when I shot this, I was using a 300mm lens and um, uh, uh, it just looks great. Yeah, then of course, sometimes um, I'm out in the desert. This was taken in Tibet. Um, uh, the story behind this was actually I was lost with two of my friends, with our driver in, in the desert. So we actually saw the sand dune and we decided just to take a walk and shoot. And um, uh, I was lagging behind because high altitude cannot walk too fast. And I saw this nice curvature, use an ultra wide angle to take this picture and everything turns out nice. So to me, travel photography is also basically um, everything that we see when we travel. I don't really have, unless I'm, I'm on assignment, uh, otherwise I don't really have a, a precise idea or I have to shoot this, I have to shoot that or whatever. Basically, travel photography is just whatever I see, whatever equipment I have at that time, and uh, just shoot whatever is possible. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, maybe for now, we, we let's see what other questions they have. Okay, go back to your your what you said, asked just now uh, from some of the uh, uh, viewers. How much time do you spend on editing? They find it very taxing. Yes, correct. So for me, um, I don't like to spend too much time on editing, actually, to be very frank. My, if people who go to my trip and uh, actually shoot with me, they, they know. I actually edit my photo very fast. Uh, like in the morning where I shoot, after I finish shooting, when I go back, take a rest, and my photo is out already, done. And I uh -huh. post it already. So which means that whatever I shoot in the morning, afternoon where I have a rest break or lunch break, I process it and done, done, done for that. And in the afternoon, I just process whatever in the night before I still I process. So every day I'll process, finish all my photos. So I don't think that editing is a very um, essential thing for me because of course you need to edit because I shoot in raw file. So when I shoot in raw, definitely I will need to edit my photos. That is the uh, uh, key thing because in raw file itself, it doesn't have any color or the uh, contrast. So it's just giving you a flat file. So you have to, instead of the camera does the job for you, so now you have to do everything yourself. That's why we need to have edit. Actually for all the photographers or, or hobbies, you need to learn how to edit your photos because that is how, that is what you want the look of the photo to be like. So instead of you uh, letting the camera does the job in JPEG, I mean, after you should finish, it's stored in JPEG, that is the camera does the job for you. But where you shoot in RAW, you have to edit yourself. So everybody has to actually know how to edit the photos. But how much time? So the key thing for me is uh, I'll spend probably about most of the photos is about two minutes for me to edit in Lightroom. And maybe some more complicated one is about five minutes. Yeah. And if there's something that I really, really like, wow, it's like I really love it so much. So I will actually edit in Lightroom. After that, I will go to Photoshop and I will enhance further because why? Lightroom is a very fast, uh, how, how I put it, it's a very fast processing uh, for, for me, which means that I can just do everything within two minutes or even five minutes and done. That, 
the photos is actually done already. But if I want to have, let's say, a little bit more on the detailing itself, I need to uh, clean up certain uh, areas and stuff like that. So I will need to go to Photoshop to do more on that, especially for big prints. So we have to actually uh, yeah. do a lot of clean up. I think I believe that William, you have this uh, well, thing. I mean, you will do this as well. Yeah. So maybe how about you, William? How much time yes, yes. do you actually spend? I, I do like Chrome and Photoshop for the um, for the final details of the images. Uh, um, how much time do I do editing really depends as well. Um, as a lot of you know, I'm also a wedding photographer, so I actually spend a lot of time on the computer doing editing. Besides my travel photos, I do a lot of editing on, 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 on wedding photos. So I have to be fast as well. It can be taxing, I agree, especially if, if I'm editing like, Sometimes I could be editing like 10,000 images per month because that includes my wedding pictures. So uh, very testing, definitely. Uh, but I also try to streamline it to make it faster. For travel photos, well, um, uh, also another reason why I like Fuji also, also for the JPEG images, it, it works just fine. You know, It works great uh, with the film simulation as well. For raw images, yes, uh, for the bigger prints and uh, for some of the details I need, I might still use the raw images, but otherwise JPEG images are good. So actually for some of my participants in my trips, I actually show them um, on the go. So when I shot an image, I can transfer the image to my mobile phone immediately and Instagram it. Uh, within 10 seconds, you know, the picture will just come out nicely. Of course, um, Instagram pictures, we might not use it for big prints or anything like that, but for some of the hobbyists, you know, they are not really going for uh, photo excellence. It's just something that they want, you know, good photos here and there. They are very happy already. So I tell them, well, if you might not like to do a lot of editing, you can just, you know, you know uh, transfer to your phone, Instagram it, and it's very fast. You can get a lot of images out very fast. But of course, for some of the more serious hobbyists, then yes, um, even during the workshops, uh, uh, travel workshops, I actually uh, uh, go through with them on certain editing uh, to make it faster and show them what we can do, you know, with flight through and Photoshop. There are a lot of things that we can do uh, to make your images look better. Um, whether is it um, uh, just getting a right feel and mood of the images or getting a right exposure, getting a right color tone, uh, all this, you know, we can always do it very fast as well. Um, and surprisingly and quite interestingly a lot of participants in the workshops uh when they saw it they realized that oh yeah sometimes uh, when you have something in mind already you don't really have to spend so much time on it and um after a while you just get the hand of it but what's more important is i'll just tell people you just got to do it more often um because i do it day in day out uh sometimes certain things comes that very naturally i'm sure for joseph as well so of course, if if I don't do Lightroom and Photoshop for one month, maybe I'll get my fingers get a bit rusty as well. <laughs> so so yeah, basically you just gotta do it often. And of course, people will say, "Oh, you know, we got day job, we don't do it that often." Well, um, uh, there's no shortcut. I mean, I used to work in the corporate world as well. Even then, I do editing in the night every night yeah so this is something that we just got to manage it somehow yeah yeah i actually agree with william is that uh, a lot of people ask me that um well i have the light room but how do i edit i'm going for a course i see a course will actually teach you on how to use all these kind of tools like the brush the uh filters and maybe how to actually catalog your your, your files or photos itself so all this uh, you're learning how to actually use the Lightroom. But at the end of the day, how much dark, I mean, the dark shadow to apply, how much brightness to apply, how much uh, this contrast or saturation that you're going to apply, that is all depends on you. So yeah. uh, that, is, that is what my feel is. But for me, the first thing is that uh, when I teach photography on the ground is I was how tell my participants or my customers is like first thing, you just got to shoot correctly first. When you shoot correctly, actually, there's nothing much you need to do. The picture is already wow, uh, correct angle, 
correct kind of like uh, uh, the zoom in is like correct. I mean, this, I mean the, the, the way you frame it is correctly, you know, so you don't need to crop anything. So everything is all correct. So right now, what you need to do is only a little bit of, let's say the saturation, the contrast, the exposure, just, just to make sure that it's correct, it's bright enough. And, and that's it. If you look at my workflow, actually, I always adjust that few things only. And that's it. And yeah, just like, uh, just well, what I actually show you on the uh, uh, screen just now, the Italy Cinque Terra shot, you guess that how much time I actually used to edit that photo. Actually, I show it in my workshop before. It only yeah. takes me one minute. It yeah. only takes me one minute to actually edit that photo. Maybe uh, we don't want to share that photo again, just yeah. now that yeah, I want to share that screen again. So maybe I will just talk. Okay. Yeah, so this is the shot. So a lot of people say, wow, it's like, uh, are, are you sure that uh, you, you did not do a lot of like Photoshop or whatever inside there? Actually, I didn't. To be very frank, I over here, if you can see my mouse cursor, I just brighten and do a little bit saturation on this, uh, on the uh, houses. So I just make it a little bit more saturated and brighter. Okay, and I actually tune the temperature to a little bit more blue tone. Okay, and I over, in the overall picture itself, I actually uh, do more saturated. And I brush the those uh what's that called the rocks over here on the on my left hand side on the left hand corner here to be brighter because when I shoot that time it's actually quite dark so I just brighten it up on the shadow side and that's it so it's like one minute actually for me I'm actually doing it very fast because I do it almost every day I know where to do the highlight where to actually increase the shadow and where to actually uh. Uh, do all the saturations and stuff like that to make it a very punchy uh, kind of photo. But uh, if you are not that uh, fast enough, but it probably take you about five minutes. But the key thing is that you have to practice. Yeah, the tool is all there. But with the experience, uh, when you practice it, then you will actually get a hang of it. So you can do it very fast as well. So actually, yep. it comes with experience. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, another question that they have, uh, let's see. Um, will you bring an iPad or laptop for travel photography or both? Do you have time to back up your images? Okay. So, um, William, you want to start first? Or? Yeah, I, well, um, okay. I, I guess these days I get a bit lazy. Of course, if I'm on a job, if I'm doing a pre-wedding overseas, definitely. I do two sets of backups every night. Uh, I do bring my laptop. I do bring, I do bring my desktop, uh, my, my, my hard disk as well to do all my relevant uh, backups, definitely. But for travel photography, again, unless I'm on assignment, um, otherwise, if I'm just on my normal travel photography, sometimes I'm, I, I have to admit I get a bit lazy, so I probably did not do my backup. But I definitely will bring my laptop as well. So, um, yeah, this is definitely things that I would do. So some people might ask, uh, you're not worried that, you know, if you are not doing your backup, what will happen? Uh, again, for the Fuji cameras, for the SD3 and the GFX, you know, there's two, um, two, two uh, SD card slots. So the images are already back up in, in the second slot. So it's okay. Um, yeah, so I don't have to worry too much about it, especially if I'm not on assignment, especially even sometimes I'm on holiday. Um, uh, I do bring a lot of equipment as well, even on holiday. Um, uh, I do get my images. And of course, for those trips, I probably don't do much backup. But on assignments, definitely, whether it's a travel photography, my pre-wedding overseas, uh, two sets of backups, definitely a must. Because um, if I lose my images, that's it. Yeah, so I cannot risk that. Yeah, what about yourself, or Joseph? Yeah, for me, I always bring my notebook, uh, I mean, my Mac, MacBook Pro uh, along. So uh, even in my trip, I always tell my customers to actually bring them when uh, you go for a tour, any tour, your family tour or even your my uh, photo tour or any tour itself. Because what I believe is um, I spend so much time and effort and uh, tra to travel all the way down there. So what if really touch wood, if something really going to happen, if like uh, the, S 
the card actually spoils. Actually, I mean, a lot of uh, photographers, they have actually this kind of issues. It's like, shoot, and they're halfway, oh, it's not the camera that is 40, but it's the card that is 40. So yeah. How? Yeah, so you will lose all your photos that have taken over the past two days. And it's <laughs> maybe one of cameras with two slots <laughs> yeah so first thing that you need camera with two slots so they can actually save it uh simultaneously that's the first thing but for me is uh i the i'm using a gfx and i'm getting the one to eight gb i mean the ssd card is the fastest and the highest capacity already but sometimes uh with the capacity it only allows me about 600 photos only yeah. So if you're going out for the whole day, 600 is not enough. So I definitely, I will need to have more than that. So that's why, uh, and the card is expensive. So I rather buy a portable hard disk. That's what my workflow is very simple. I get a MacBook, I get a portable hard disk, uh, let's say a four tera portable hard disk. And every day I just dump everything inside and I just format my SD card. Because one SD card is like, maybe $300 for one SD card, but a portable hard disk is only $100 or $200. So I think it's, it's worth, worth it to actually invest in a portable hard disk, I mean, as a backup solution. So that's uh, what I'm doing, basically. That's my workflow. So I actually uh, back up everything because I edit every day. You see, my workflow is that I edit every day and I back up at the same time. So that's my workflow, yeah. Nice, nice, definitely. Uh, okay, maybe we show some more photos to yep. share with our, to our viewers before they, they, they get bored. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so maybe Joseph, uh, uh, where are some of the exotic places that you think uh, uh, is not exotic enough for the viewers? Uh, maybe exactly. like the Okay, maybe I can show some places. Okay, like this one. Okay, we'll talk about this. Okay. We can share the screen. Okay, okay. We we'll talk about this is not really exotic, but is uh I believe that not a lot of people actually went to this place before. Also, this is in Cuba, so I went to Cuba before. Uh, it was like quite a tough uh process to actually get in there. Yeah, so I actually uh you actually need to get a visa before that before the Cuba actually opens up because I think that when Obama actually uh was uh, it was in position has actually opens up the uh travel i mean they, they, they actually leave out the, the band but right now i don't know what is uh the situation right now no so the, I, <laughs> sorry no status update yeah no status update so right now it's like i don't know whether do you still need a visa to go in or not yeah so the last time i actually did i have a visa to go in and i actually went there so this is one of the shot that i have right that uh is in cuba so they are actually dancing in the street yeah okay. i actually have a flash with me and then i just took a shot with that yeah okay. so okay then this is one of the more exotic places where i don't think that a lot of people actually went to this place uh i mean they, make papa. a guess papa new guinea no it's not papa new guinea it looks like Papua New Guinea, but it's not. Papua New Guinea got more colors on the face and okay. stuff like that. This okay. is Funatu. It's near to Fiji Island. You know oh. Fiji? Yeah. I, I, so yeah. it's just below is Vanuatu. So yeah. during that time, I actually have a crazy plan. I don't know why I want to go there. I actually went online and I saw someone uh, actually took a picture on, on, on the tribe. So I said, okay, so why not? I just go on my own and I just go and do something on that. So I just went there myself and I just shoot this, uh, the tracks over there. So this is one of the photos. So they actually basically wearing nothing. I have actually a lot more photos on that, but the thing is that uh, because it's a live, so I do not want to show too much of the naked kind of uh, photos. So actually men and women, they are actually all naked. Yeah. So actually this is the best that I can find already that uh, is really cover up everything. Okay, okay. just imagine they're not cover up, okay? Yeah, so nothing uh, other A or, yeah, correct, but it's, it, this, that is their culture, you see. They actually live in that uh, kind of condition. Over here in Venatu, they actually, what is their main staple? You can see that they have a tummy, you know, a tummy. So 
uh, all the men and women, they, they don't eat rice. They eat starch, a lot of starch, all like tapioca, sweet potato. So that is their daily st stapler. So it's like, yeah, they actually eat all these uh, kind of a very starchy kind of uh, food. That's why they have, I don't know, but uh, that's why they have a very big tummy over there. <laughs> yeah, okay. right. So this uh, Vernatu is one of the exotic places that I actually went. Um, okay, and yeah, so this one is also the, it's also in Vernatu as well. So I take it a very clean shot. So I just asked the kid, say, hey kid, come, look at me. So I was just taking it from top down. So uh -huh. he's actually looking uh, at the sky. So uh -huh. that's how I actually got the shot. So that's why the eyes actually have that catch light okay. over there. Yeah, so it's a very simple shot, right? Okay. How, how about you? Uh, uh, William? Um, uh, probably not a lot of exotic places like yourself, but uh, probably I just share with um, the viewers a bit of our perspective on, on, on photography, on travel photography. So um, what I have here is, uh, let's see, um, just to show viewers, um, why sometimes uh, I always talk about looking things, looking at things differently, and uh, it's always good to to look at things differently, and you can get nice, more interesting photos. I would say, yeah. So, um, let's see. okay. So this was taken in the um, yeah. This was taken in Prague. So I guess um, a lot of people have been to Prague and um, they've, you know, always seen the Charles Bridge, the Prague Castle and things like that. So um, this is actually the Prague Castle. And um, this was actually taken on Charles Bridge itself um, on a evening, evening sunset hour kind of thing. So um, I saw a lot of birds flying around and things like that. So I thought it, it, it makes it very interesting to frame the Prague Castle with the birds. And uh, no, the birds are not photoshopped in case anybody is wondering. Um, but I just frame them nicely, um, uh, you know, with the, with, the, with the birds, frame the Prague Castle nicely with the birds. So again, um, it's not something that uh, when you Google Prague Castle, you always see a lot of images of Prague Castle. But again, images like this is something that is very me. Um, uh, shapes, lines, and, 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 and things like that. And uh, of course, maybe black and white. And it's also another image that we don't see often. So I always like to bring people to a new perspective um, on, on the places that they went, go to. Um, again, for all my participants, I always tell them, um, even there are some places I've been a lot of times, but every trip there, I try to look at it differently with a fresh you know, pair of eyes. At least, you know, I can get something different. And uh, the next image, this image is actually of a boatman uh, docking at the ship. So um, a lot of people are shooting, you know, I'm actually on the second level. There are two levels. So a lot of people are actually showing on, on the first level, getting images of the uh, of the boatman. Uh, it's raining. That's why he's wearing a hat. So I told my participants, okay, why not we just go up there and get a different view? So I really love the the lines, the shape, the triangular, the circle, uh, the, the 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 hand. You know, uh, as a travel photographer, you know the hand, the, the 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 details on the hand tells me so much story about the boatman. But again, I don't have to show the boatman's face. Um, I just show a graphic image, a triangle, a circle of the head, the hand, and it tells so much about the image. So this is what I usually like, and. Um, yeah, just to 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 let people uh, read more about the image. Yeah, another image. This was actually in in Finland. I was actually on the uh, dot sledge. So um, again, sometimes you know the sledge goes very fast, and this was actually in December where we only have like one or two hours of daylight, and it was so beautiful. I just love the the colors uh, at that time of the year and uh, even on the sledge, I just have to take images uh, on the sledge. So I, I, I just table myself and of course it's running very fast. But from this perspective, you know, it, 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 it just shows that we are so dwarfed 
by by the trees around us and things like that. So, you know, it it, it brings you into the image, uh, looking at the trees above us and uh, with the colors. Um, it's just something that I liked a lot. And of course, another image that I liked, uh, this was in Mongolia. Um, uh, they were putting on the horseshoe for the horse and things like that. And um, uh, again, a lot of people like to use a long lens to shoot, uh, book out the background and things like that. Yes, there's definitely nothing wrong with it, uh, but I like to go close. And um, uh, well, they're not really, they're not performing for us. Uh, I was staying with the nomads. So basically these are their daily chores and things like that. And, and using a wide angle, you can see the perspective, the, the, the leading lines um, uh, to the people uh, create such a dynamic uh, view for us. So this is why I like go close as well and um, uh, try to get a different perspective. I always tell my customers, my, my, my participants, my students, and tell them sometimes we don't always need to use a long lens to shoot images like this. I don't need to book here the background and uh, with a different perspective, it can be interesting. Another image, um, this was in Myanmar. Um, this lady was making pottery and things like that. Again, a lot of people would like to show at the, at the ground level uh, with a long lens, 70-200 or uh, Fuji terms, 56mm or 90mm bokeh on the background. Fantastic bokeh, fantastic image. Uh, you will never go wrong. But why not try to try a different perspective? So um, uh, I was actually standing, I was not standing on top of anything, but I was using a wide angle. So uh, wide angle in this case was the 816, the Fuji 816. And uh, I just you know, stretched out my hand down and get a different perspective. And I, I love it because you know, she's colorful and she actually stands out from the very dull, you know, brownish background. And this is what makes it look interesting from a different perspective. I don't have to book out the background, but I can use a wide angle create a different kind of image and it still looks interesting. So so for this image itself, it's like, are you standing on a, what's that called, on a ladder or you actually get a chair to actually oh, make the shot? Tiptoeing, tiptoeing on the 16. So I was, oh, okay. HMM, yeah. Yeah, because- okay, so uh, you're actually tiptoeing it and then after she's actually sitting down there and you just uh, raise your hand up and just yeah. shoot. Correct, okay. so, so that's basically raising my hand and shooting down. Yes. Yeah. So basically, that is what we call uh, visualizing the shot because you actually don't see it from top of the. I mean, you 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 basically you cannot be like going there and then see from your what's that called from your camera itself. So you're actually visualizing the shot. I think visualizing the shot is one of the very important thing in travel photography. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Definitely. So yeah. So just some some ideas about how how I go about uh, doing my travel photography. Uh, always try to get a different. <laughs> Uh, uh, perspective yeah just okay just hold on a minute maybe uh, we answer some questions uh, very good yeah. coming in very fast what i saw one of the question is that uh do you always buy travel insurance for your equipment on your assignment or travel trip so uh i don't think that we have any photography uh insurance for equipment in uk or us or even in australia that there are uh this kind of insurance itself just covering the uh camera yields you know so you probably can cover about twenty thousand. so but in singapore i'm so sorry i tried to find but no one actually covers it yeah because they know that uh we singaporean probably breaks a lot of cameras yeah so <laughs> so right yeah. now uh what in my experience that i always buy uh travel insurance of course so per uh, let me go a little bit on the details on the travel insurance itself because I claim uh, before and my customers also claim before. So maybe speak through the experience is that uh, per item itself, it depends on your coverage. It's about $500 to $1,000 per item, which means that let's say the lens is 40, it only covers you $500. If your lens is worth $2,000, I'm so sorry. They only give you back $500 and uh, that's it. Yeah, so if you crack it, uh, so the, you you probably can only get that amount, right? So so this is from my experience. <laughs> yeah. So how about you, uh, William? Did you have I, this kind of? Well, I, I many many years ago, I used to have uh, insurance that covers my studio, which includes overseas. 
but I have never claimed before. So I never knew whether that insurance was good enough. But something happened in between and uh, I lapsed the insurance and uh, I just never cover it anymore. But travel insurance, definitely, I must have. Uh, so again, I tell my participants, all of you should have a travel insurance in terms of maybe flights delay and et cetera, et cetera. Equipment, uh, like you have mentioned, uh, not much coverage we have here. Uh, it's just a risk that we have to bear, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately. But, uh, okay, let's see some of the other questions. Um, uh, do you guys... Do you guys travel with family? If so, do you bring many gears with you or try to carry as light as possible? Well, I don't have a kid. I mean, I do travel with my family. Uh, my, 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 my dad and things like that. I do travel with a lot of equipment as well. Um, yeah, but uh, I can't say much for people with kids. So maybe Joseph can share a bit on that. <laughs> okay, I, I, I did. I just did one family trip for 45 days with my family only just uh, last year, November. So we came days. back wow. 45 days with my family. Yeah, correct. Okay. So uh, we went around the world. So it's like I traveled from Singapore to New to where's the place? Uh, LA. Then from LA, then down to South America, Colombia, where we have the protests. And then after that, we went to Antarctica and then to uh, Europe before we fly back to Singapore. Nice. So I for for me that is a half of it is a family trip and half is a my own uh i mean business trip basically so but if when i am alone with my family normally i just bring one camera and that's it sometimes i don't even bring a camera out yeah so i actually like to use lightweight camera like the st3 so it's very lightweight and with that small little lens itself the uh what's that lens is 816 and yeah. there's a wide angle wide angle and another one is a 50 I think it's a seven eighteen fifty five, if I'm not wrong, and that is also a very good lens for uh, traveling. So I actually use a lot of that kind of lens to actually uh, shoot. Yeah, and I find the SC three is very very good for uh, travel, especially it's like so lightweight, and then the quality is so good. You know, if you can see one of my project that I did with uh, SC three is on Nor in Norway. I actually use that to shoot video and as well as. Um, the photos itself and the quality is wow nice and i basically said i after i use my sd3 the sd3 and the gfx i just basically want to ah, gfx forget it i don't want to bring out anymore you know <laughs> because it's it's heavy i mean if you if you don't compare i mean it's all right but once you compare it then you will know but and how about sd4 i i i know that you are actually um uh, using SD4, so you have the first hand uh, experience on SD4. You actually did a video on that, and as well yeah. as actually, you are the uh, one of the first, um, I mean, as a Fuji from S photographer uh, using that uh, camera. Okay. So, you want to talk about the your experience? Well, okay, maybe I just touch a bit about that. I mean, I'm sure some of the viewers have watched the uh, live broadcast between myself and Benny uh, earlier part of the month, uh, sharing images on SD4. Um, SD4 definitely is a, a lot of improvement over SD3 uh, in terms of video and uh, images uh, are still still quality as well, still images. Uh, of course, most importantly, you know, is the IBIS and the flip screen, you know, it's so different from SD3. Um, of course, the size might be a bit bigger, but uh, it's not that noticeable. Uh, just that, of course, the grip is much bigger, but also because it packs more power with the battery. Um, but otherwise, um, uh, I love it. I love it a lot. And um, uh, in fact, I can't wait to get my hands on it, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just, for, for, for videographers, again, uh, I was sharing with the guys uh, in the broadcast the other time. Uh, I'm not a full-fledged videographer, definitely, but uh, with my limited knowledge on videos, uh, I can see that a lot of things have improved and um, I can actually shoot. I, I thought I, 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 I enjoyed the video functions quite a lot. And the still images, um, uh, definitely with the IBs, it helps a lot, especially for, for travel photographers like us. You know, uh, sometimes we don't have tripods with us. Uh, sometimes we shoot in the cold. And um, with with the uh, IBs, you know, it helps a lot in getting steady shots. 
So yeah. just one question for you. So, uh, with the IBS itself, what is the minimum, I mean, the, the lowest shutter speed that you can actually hold? I mean, well, for GFS, I, I know, but for the ST4, maybe it's a different IBS or, yeah, so maybe you want to... Okay, I did not push myself that much for that camera that time when I was shooting in Hokkaido. So the most I did was maybe two or three seconds. Uh, wow. But... Um, I, I understand from, from, from Benny, he actually managed to do it longer. I can't remember. But uh, yeah, I'm sure you can, we can actually uh, push it long, longer. But again, because that time I was uh, uh, very involved in the Hokkaido project, I have to get my stuff done and things that I don't really push the limits. And um, yeah, uh, but I'm sure it's something that we can try out uh, uh, when Good news when the shipment is in. <laughs> yeah. so, so, and the next question, I think the viewers will actually want to know is like when the shipment is coming, do you have any kind of like time frame? I mean, yeah, still still from I, the management. As far as I understand, the shipment is in, and uh, we should hear from Fuji from Singapore uh, before June. And uh, I mean, for all those viewers out there who is watching this broadcast, if you are interested in ST four. Do leave some comments uh, uh, in our, our feed uh, so Fuji will know that, you know, how many of you are interested. But of course, um, having said that, uh, um, stay tuned to the Fuji Film Singapore uh, Facebook page. Uh, details should be up very soon. And uh, yeah, I'm sure you guys, a lot of people I know have been waiting for it. So do look out for it. Yeah. You want to share some photos on your Hokkaido? When using uh, the SD4, do you have some in your computer right now? Yeah. yeah uh, yes, I, I think I'd like to actually see the quality itself on the SD4. Okay, let me see if I have it here. Because I probably not load much here. Okay, I have a few images here that is from SD4. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are in our CB uh, period now. We cannot really see the images in the Fujifilm studio because I have a few images printed out at the Fujifilm studio that people can see if we are not under CB. But of course now we cannot really uh, uh, view the images. But as soon as we open up, I'm sure um, uh, some of you should actually drop by to have a look at some of the actual prints. And uh, these are just some of the images I have of the um, uh, ST4. So let me see. Okay, maybe I just address one of the questions that I saw on the Facebook itself, Facebook page itself, is that um, how do you get the story? Do you camp out there and wait? Yeah, so for me, I think uh, normally I will actually walk because in travel itself we i don't have the luxury of time to actually camp down there and wait i'm not like uh derek so derek actually came down there it can go go there and after it could go back away for 15 minutes because i heard from the last session but for me i just walk and whatever i see i should so sometimes i do wait for a little bit but not 15 minutes maybe say about two three minutes i'm okay i'm okay for waiting for that if less, it's really a very good shot. But normally we don't have that kind of um, luxury. I mean, because we have we are going to move, we're going to walk from A to B, and then we only got a limited time frame while we are traveling. So that's the that's the thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to add on to that, before I touch on the some of the SD four images, um, uh, I I do well it depends on my genre of photography as well. Uh, uh, I do wait a bit and actually for some of my participants who have been with me on my trips, uh, the way I plan my itinerary is that we do have um, quite a bit of time to actually um, wait for things to happen uh, because I don't want to rush through things. And so, yeah, we do wait a bit. Uh, also for wildlife photography, which I'll touch on a bit later, uh, I do wait a bit for things to happen to get some of the images. Um, for streets, yes, uh, for some of the landscape stuff, I, I do wait a bit here and there. Um, uh, when I used to do my Aurora trips, I, I, I used to wait for, I used to shoot throughout the night for six, seven hours. So yeah, some of the crazy things we do. But uh, yeah, before I 
go on further just to share a yep. bit of images. Maybe you want to share your images on the ST4. I think the viewers are <laughs> really rushing us already for that. Yeah. Okay, so so this was just saw four images from ST4. Um uh yeah, these are some of the images uh, in Hokkaido. Um, uh, some of the fox and uh, when it was snowing and things like that. Uh, this was shot with the 100-400 mm lens uh, with a two times TC, I think. Yeah, so of course, um, I was out in the open. It was snowing quite heavily uh, with a long lens. Uh, the IBs definitely helped a lot uh, because the fox is actually moving quite a fair bit. Um, I was really going after the fox to get a shot uh, in the snow. So with the IBs, uh, it helps a, a lot because um, otherwise, uh, sometimes some uh, images might be blurred as well, especially with a long lens with a two times TC. Um, yeah, the, I'm sure a lot of people know there will be some difficulty. So again, um, this was with the SD4 as well. With, this should be with the um, uh, SF 200 mm lens. And uh, I love it. Um, uh, of course, uh, sometimes images, Wildlife images, I always tell my participants as well, um, I try to create certain stories in it. Um, instead of shooting the fox alone or things like that, uh, I capture it at that moment where the fox was looking at the two, two crows looking at each other. So it, it, it creates a certain story in the images, like, you know, what's the fox thinking? And, and for the viewers to actually uh, deduce themselves, you know, what is happening at this point of time and um, uh, yeah, what goes on behind uh, the, the animal's mind and things like that. So of course, um, ST4 images, all these are ST4 images, um, um, uh, nice, uh, uh, sharp images. Uh, this was with the 200 mm lens as well, uh, F2. And um, again, for wildlife photography, I try to wait for the moment. So um, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been to Hokkaido to see the cranes as well. Um, they move very fast. And again, they... they um, when when they uh, crow, I think you call that when they make noise, uh, it doesn't last for very long, and the 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 the, the vapor doesn't come out well forever. So for me, focusing have to be fast. So for SD four, focusing uh, uh, definitely a, a marked imp improvement over uh, SD three. So uh, even for SD three in the past, you know, uh, if you have seen some of my images in Kenya with SD three on the project, um, I really don't have any problems with focusing as well so st4 is even better than that so you can almost imagine you know how much better can that be so uh, again this was with a 100 400 400 mm lens uh two times tc early in the morning um, i'm sure a lot of people who have been to hokkaido for the cranes would know this place as well uh very far far away uh, 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 uh location uh, where you definitely need a long, very long lens to shoot the images. Very cold in the morning, minus 30. So again, um, SD4, as with most of the uh, S, uh, SD cameras, uh, can withstand all the minus 30, minus 20 degrees temperature with no issue at all. And uh, um, with a with long lens with two times TC, even in this kind of weather, I was not using a tripod, I was using hand holding, uh, no issues capturing images like this. So do look forward to more announcements from uh, Fujifilm Singapore uh, Facebook page uh, for the ST4. Yep. Do, do you feel that the ST4 colors are more, is much more better than the rest of, I mean, the previous cameras, I mean, the predecessor? Well, do you feel that it's better? Price, or it's about the same? I, personally, I feel that it's, it's about the same. I don't see any significant difference. Um, I mean, I've always loved Fujifilm colors, and um, uh, anyway, a lot of colors I do, even if I'm not into the original colors, I do do a bit of tone, toning for the images. So, um, yeah, to me, the colors, um, not much difference from the predecessors, and uh, even then, not much difference for me. Yeah, and um, uh, yeah, so, so I... I that's not something that um, I, will, I will pay much notice of, but I will pay much more notice on the uh, focusing and things like that, and the tracking, of course, for wildlife photography, yeah. tracking, um, uh, the focusing, and you know, all these things are definitely very important to me. So um, these two things definitely have a lot of improvement over the uh, predecessors, definitely. So, yeah, I would say... Um, well, as soon as uh, the CV is over, 
um, I'll encourage a lot of people to, you know, if you are still considering the SD4, yeah. uh, of course, try it at the studio and uh, test it for yourself and see uh, uh, how much better is it. And I'm sure, you know, you guys will not be disappointed. Yeah. I'm actually looking for it. I mean, I was just waiting for it to be launched and to get a hand of it, you know, to get the stock for it. Yeah, so I'm really very excited to actually um, waiting after the CV. It's like, wow, well, I'll just <laughs> grab and play with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's from, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, you were saying? I was oh, just no. okay. Some questions, yeah. Okay, for me, so I just want to actually highlight a bit on the uh, profile of the Fuji itself. So it's like there's a lot of color profile. So some of my, the color profile that I like actually is like the uh, Chrome Classic. Yeah, that which I actually use quite a lot. And for black and white, I actually use a lot on the uh, Acra. I mean, the uh, this uh, Acro, sorry. Not yeah. Acra, Acros, sorry, Acros, yes, correct. Yeah, so these are some of the, the profile that I actually uh, like it a lot. And that's one of the reasons why I actually choose Fujifilm because it has the very correct color simulation like the old film, the film on the film days are basically. So actually basically when I shoot in the digital, but actually I get the look of the film simulation and yeah. which other cameras doesn't have that. I mean, yes, you can be very close, but it's not as close as the original, you know. So that's one of the reasons why I actually choose Fujifilm. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, in fact, for the film simulation, I love I love the Acros uh, uh, plus Y filter. That's my favorite for the black and white. I love the Via Via for all my sunset and sunrise shots. Uh, uh, for people who used to shoot slides like yourself. Uh, I would say, you know, the Velvia colors replicate yeah. the slides so well, so nicely that, um, you know, it's something I cannot get in Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, correct. You just yeah. you just can't see the difference. It's like wow. It's like really the punch is there. The color itself is just wow. It's it's that look. You know, it's the look. It's exactly correct. the look. Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. It's 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 just amazing. It's just something that. I mean, if, if I never used slides before last time, I wouldn't have known. But if I've used slides, I, I realized that you know, they replicate it so nicely. But of course, uh, uh, since I told my participants, I probably wouldn't use that for you know all the landscape shots and stuff like that. But for sunrise and sunset, it's definitely, to me, is the to-go film simulation. Yeah. yeah. Last time I don't use, uh, it was like two years ago, I don't use color profile. Normally, I'll just add it to whatever that I liked. But after when I used the GFX 50S, which is my first camera, and wow, that is a classic room. And I like that kind of feel, the soft feel, and that is like very desaturation kind of feel. And that is where I started to actually use a lot on the color profile. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we can want to uh, show some of your other photos or probably we can address some of the questions yeah okay maybe okay maybe i can show some uh okay maybe i can show some wildlife images for for some for some of the guys who like like to go you know africa and and, and things like that um yep. just some of the images that you guys can shoot when you're there when you're there okay i always to me i always tell people when we go to africa you know is um it's not like going to the zoo, you know? So of course, uh, 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 it's okay to shoot close-ups. I always tell people, since you are there, why not try to shoot some uh, landscape photos with the animals and uh, it should look fantastic. And um, this is always what I try to advocate to, to my participants and um, try to create certain, certain stories in your images, create certain tension in the images as well. To make it look, you know, uh, uh, a bit more exciting. Yeah. So okay, the first image that we have here, um, the lions. Oh, I like this. Uh, yeah, I like the, the okay. Right. So so I I really like it because um we were very careful. You know, we try not to disturb the the hunt. So um, you know, play with the depth of field, uh, with the long lens and things like that. And you know, it creates that tension to a viewer. You look at it, you feel like, oh, you know what's going to happen. You know, uh, 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 
it's a zebra going to be the the meal for the lions and things like that. Well, fortunately for the zebra and unfortunately for the lions, uh, it didn't happen because the lions are pretty young. So they are still not that experienced. So they started the uh, zebra and off the zebra went. So, but this is basically what I meant by creating tension in the images. So again, uh, a family of cheetahs, um, uh, you know, uh, some people actually ask me, do I purposely blow out the background and things like that? Yes, uh, black and white, but um, black and brown doesn't say a lot of things. So I blow out the background, make it all white. And I like the, the family emotions, you know, between the cub and the mother. So um, I like images like this. So instead of just showing, you know, just a close up or whatever, I like to show, show the surroundings. Uh, I include the, the other cup at the right hand corner, looking at them, you know, uh, maybe a bit of sibling rivalry there. You know, create stories with, with your images, you know, not just a, a close up of a leopard or a lion uh, uh, and things like that. Uh, we can always do that in the zoo. Yeah, so so try to capture details like that. So in terms of travel photography, again, I always try to touch on the details. Again, uh, uh, the tension in the images. You know, uh, the, 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 the jackal was feeding on the carcass of a wilder beast. The vulture was looking at it, and the jackal was looking at the, at, the, at the vulture as well. So a lot of tension there. So it's something that I liked about all these images and not just a straightforward image uh, uh, of, a, of a feeding, for example. Yeah, um, same thing with the beasts crossing the Mara River. Um, you can see it from far end, the crocodile is feeding on the wilder beast. So again, the wilder beast was you know, looking at his compatriots, you know, running across the river. You know, there's a bit of sadness in the image as well. It's not just the crocodile eating the wilder beast, but it's also the, um, the 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 wilder beast looking at his friends, you know, crossing a river. And he himself is becoming a meal for for the crocodile. So again, um, um, framing images, uh, we get that all the time in street photography, in landscape photography, uh, wildlife photography as well. Instead of shooting just the deer, I have the leaves, you know, covering them, uh, uh, framing it to make it a bit more interesting. Then uh, of course, um, wilder beast crossing the Mara River, uh, catch it when, you know, it's up in the air instead of just, you know, uh, uh, everything in the water. Um, the connection of the zip, uh, 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 giraffes during the sunrise. So these are always all the details that I look out for in the images, even for wildlife. So even for this um, uh, herd, uh, herd of zebras, uh, I feel the whole screen. So a lot of people were asking me whether is this a color photo or black and white photo, you know, images like this always make people uh, have more questions and and somehow uh, uh, it arouses their interests. Yeah, so this is what I try to achieve for all these images. Uh, framing of elephants, uh, this is more street photography style, but a style of street photography, you apply it to wildlife photography to make it look a bit more interesting. Um, yeah. So that's all the images that I share. Of course, lastly, um, uh, framing again of the um, young antelope between the two adult antelope. So um, yeah, things like that. So these are just some of the uh, images that I like to do even for wildlife photography. And uh, on the last few images are just lighting, waiting for good lighting. So to answer some of the questions that some people might have, they say, do you wait for the images? Do you uh, wait very long and stuff like that. Yes, uh, I do wait a bit for certain action, certain lights to come about. Uh, but of course, I cannot wait for the whole day. So again, with experiences, we know when or how uh, uh, long we might need to wait and should we wait or not. And um, yeah, so all this comes to play all together. Yep, so that's some of the images. And of course, lastly, what I have... Uh, no, okay, that's it. So... Yeah, some of the wildlife images. Nice. I'll make it faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, we are a bit overrun also. Yeah, but anyway, uh, what I will do is that uh, we will fast track a little bit. Yeah. I'll talk a bit on the seascape itself okay. for myself. Uh, so that we have a little bit of variety. So because we have been talking about the wildlife and I think that uh, probably I'll touch a bit on seascape and maybe some landscape kind of photos. Right. So... Okay, let me Maybe share. share my screen. Yeah. Okay, so seascape basically is um, you, 
first thing is that you need to wake up very early in the morning. Yeah. And also in the late in the uh, evening where you want to have all the spectrums because you like to have all this kind of good lighting. Of course, you can do it in the afternoon as well. So it also depends on the places itself that you, you are going and what kind of photos that you want to get. Okay, first and foremost is that we need to have a tripod, a very good tripod that you can go very low and it's very sturdy because with all the wave and water and um, because it's in the sea, so which means that we're going to be wet. So all this very stable tripod will actually uh, restrict the movement when the wave, the sea wave actually comes in. Yeah, so this is uh, the first thing. Second thing is that you need to go very close and you need to get wet. So your gear, what you're wearing, you definitely have to be waterproof. That is uh, for sure. Right. Like example for this shot itself, we need to use, actually for most of seascape, you need to use filters because you need to control the kind of texture on the water itself. Like for example, for this photo itself, I'm actually using a filter to control the wave itself that comes in and when it drags out, so it can give you a very kind of smooth kind of feel on the wave itself. And plus you have to have the texture on the water. So controlling of the wave I mean, the uh, shutter speed is very important when you're taking seascape, right? So you can see from here, you see if you are able to see my cursor, there is details on the wave. It's not like I'm going to drag it like, let's say for 30 seconds and everything will be all, actually you will not see the wave, but you can see the sand actually. Yeah, or it will be all, all washed out, means all white. Yeah. But what we want is actually the texture. So you have to control it around, maybe say one second or so in order for you to get that kind of wave details. So then come back against that. What is the thing that you, you, what is the setting that you need to use to control? So first thing, first is that you know that you need to have a one second kind of uh, speed. All right. So now second thing, what is the thing that you need is uh, ISO. Correct, ISO is 50. You know your speed, you know your ISO is going to be as low as possible. Then what is the aperture, right? Then you have to control between the ISO and aperture to equals to the shutter speed. So which then I will need to balance it out. Yeah, so that is how we actually need to do a calculation on the balance itself on, the, uh, on all the settings. Yeah, on all the te technical settings basically. Right, so right. let me go on to the next scene. So this is also a seascape where the wave is actually coming in. But this time around, I do not need to have the, uh, what's that called, the wave itself because the rocks itself is already very dramatic. So when I see it myself, it's like, wow, okay, I like it. So I need to actually put my wide angle and I need to tilt it down. And I have to go very close. Actually, from this angle on this uh, picture itself, it looks like it is uh, taken from far or maybe say it's not, it's like from top. Actually, I'm actually doing it on the low, lower ground, which means that it's uh, at my knee level when I shoot it that time. Yeah, because of the perspective itself, I want it to go all the way to the end of the horizon. So that's why I have to actually go down and have the kind of feel. So positioning of your camera itself is actually very important in this case. Right. And this is also another one uh, which I have to actually go into the water itself. And uh, yeah, I have to walk into the cave or this rock area, which is like 30 minutes of walking in the rocks and climbing the rocks. <laughs> so when all these pictures are presented to you, you do not know how much effort we actually go in to actually do this kind of shot. Yeah, this is taken in Spain. So they have this uh, one of the iconic kind of rock. So I actually go there and then just take this. And, and luckily it's a uh, good weather, it's a sunset. And the wave actually, you have to read on the tide as well. Because on, on this day itself, the tide is actually low. So that's how we are able to go in. But actually two days later, the tide is high tide and we, we are not able to go in at the same time. So the tide is very important. So you have to read tide 
uh, the tight level and also you have to see whether is it a good weather or not so whether to is it worth to go in and shoot because if it's going to be a cloudy day or rainy day so you know that you it won't be nice at all so do you want to uh walk in for 30 minutes and to make that shot so you have to do all the calculations so that's why for me whenever i do a photo tour or when i do a tour i will just make myself at least two days or three days to for me to stay down there so i will do a bit of things and we need to see the weather so if the weather is good then we go for the shot if not normally i will just go to the restaurant and eat <laughs> so that's <laughs> for me <laughs> right okay this is the same the same thing uh this uh rock but inside a cave so it gives a different perspective and also it gives a very focus um because of the window uh, the framing itself and the refraction as well so actually it give you a very uh, uh the framing which actually shows the rock itself yeah so basically with this one i play with the uh, lighting itself because outside is very harsh the light is very harsh so that's why I have to go and find something because I went there quite early and the light is actually, uh, you can see a blue sky basically. So I will need to actually find something to frame it. So in order for me not to uh, uh, just shoot it and then it's so, the light is so harsh, I can't do anything at all. So this is a framing. So we try to actually uh, find a different perspective when the lighting is not unfavorable of us. So in this case, we do shadow lighting, right? And this is in Iceland. It's a very simple shot uh, wave. It can be like a wallpaper if you like it. So same thing as well is that you have to control the wave. So how do you get all the wave, the, the strip of uh, wave, the lines, I mean, the, the uh, how to say, in the picture itself, all the wave, you can see the strip of the, all the lines. Basically, the wave have to come after you, which means that it has to go past you and when you retreat that time then you start to press your shutter uh your, your shutter wet, right? sorry that's when you will get wet also oh uh, yes that's when that's when you will get wet also so in, yeah. in this in this to get this shot i you have to risk of getting your feet cold and definitely it's going to be wet i actually in iceland i bring three pair of shoes because I know that with my style, my kind of photography style, I will get wet. So wherever I go back, I just dry, use the hair dryer and dry my boots, you know, every day. Every single day I have to do that. <laughs> so sometimes I it's wet in the morning. And then after I have to go out in the afternoon. So I have to have another pair of shoes, you see. So it's like, wow, this is it's, it's tough when you are shooting seascape. Definitely it's tough. And for this one also in Iceland, I think that a lot of people actually go to Iceland and shoot the this uh, uh, the uh, the ice itself, the floating yeah. ice, basically. Yeah, correct. And how do you actually get them to be very dramatic and uh, nice? Is that you have to go very close. I'm using a sixteen thirty five uh, or, 20, or even twenty four mm. I just need to go close, very close. And this is quite dangerous because. Behind there is a lot of those kind of chunky ice uh, uh, behind me. And when, when the wave comes in, the ice will actually move. So sometimes you don't know how it's going to move, you see. And when it lands on, when the chunk of ice lands onto your feet, it's just a rock that lands onto your feet. So you have to actually, uh, besides shooting, you have to also see behind uh, how how is the uh, ice going to, to, to float, you see. Yeah, so that uh, you don't put yourself in a dangerous position. So all these kind of things are the uh, ground experience that uh, we have that I can actually advise that uh, whenever you shoot this kind of seascape, first thing is that you have to see around you. Don't just shoot and not seeing behind. So you have to be sure that you are very safe. Yeah. So, okay, then I will skip. This, I think, nothing much also was keep. Okay, so this is how we should, I should want my participant. So this is how we actually get that shot. So I'm actually shooting him because he just shoot the, in Iceland, he just shoot the rock. So I think that, okay, well, I have that shot. But why not I include him inside? I said, hey, you don't move for two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so you just imagine that he don't move for two seconds. Yeah, and, and I actually uh, use, 
I actually used uh, this two seconds to make this shot. And you can see the kind of wave that comes in and retreat, right? Yeah, so that is how we do our shot on the ground, right? Okay, this is in uh, Lofoten. And I also use the, this is, I'm using the ST3 to shoot this shot itself. And also I control it using an ND3 filter. So uh, I, to get that kind of texture. So I also control it around uh, one to two seconds. Yeah, so normally for a wave, you want to have the texture, normally it's about one to two seconds. This is one of the tips that I can actually share with everyone, right? Okay, I think uh, it's end of my, yeah, end of my slides here. Okay. Interesting. I don't do a lot of seascapes actually. Yeah, but definitely it's something that will it, it actually makes you get get very dirty. Oops. Sorry, sorry, my phone is ringing. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay. Okay, sorry for the um, for the phone. <laughs> Forgot to put it on silent, but anyway, that was a very good. Uh, that was a a call from Fujifilm. Uh, that is uh, good news for a lot of people. Uh, Fujifilm just called me and said that um, they are making arrangements for people to buy SD four online for the coming week. So I'm sure this is good news to a lot of people. And uh, do stay tuned on uh, Facebook for the details of the purchase of the SD four in the coming week. Yeah. Wow, Fuji from is really listening to our talk. Eh? And <laughs> yeah, yeah please do leave your interest in the comment and saying that okay, maybe say, uh, I would like to have information on ST4 or just a uh, ST4 please or something like that. Just a very short um a message so yeah. that I think the the uh, Fuji will actually contact you after that when it's uh in when the stock is in. So so. Definitely, they are listening to us, uh, to 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 you guys, you consumers as well. So, so yeah, uh, make some interests known and uh, seek, and you shall be given. <laughs> okay, maybe uh, it's about nine thirty. Uh, maybe we we just go through a bit of questions. Then we are probably yeah. done for the night. Yeah. Um, let's wow. One well, of the comments is that live sales some more. I say actually it's not a live sales. It's actually uh actually need a live session, but we don't know what is we just talk. So and that that that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just got to wait and uh yeah. hear read, read the news. Okay, but anyway, I have a question here. Um uh, if you guys can only bring one lens to bring on the trip, what lens would it be? And uh yeah. I don't know what 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 lens will you bring. For me, it was just one lens. I used to like uh sixteen thirty five a lot because I find that sixteen thirty five uh, wide angle lens will be able to create a lot of uh, shots, especially if let's say I'm traveling less in the city. Uh, sixteen thirty five will be a very nice lens to bring. But uh, okay, let me uh, give you an example why. In city itself, you shoot a lot of buildings. So when you shoot buildings, right? So you because all these buildings are very tall and they're very close to you. So you, you got no choice but to, in order to shoot that, you have to have a wide angle. So that is what I feel. So it's like best for, for travel itself. So whenever I go for a museum tour or whatever, so first thing I will bring is the wide angle lens and that's it. So I just bring it and then it's very versatile. 35 is a standard, kind of like standard view and the wide angle. So I got both. Yeah, in, in uh, that I can use. But the thing is that right now I'm using more on a prime lens. So I normally I will use a 45 mm uh, on a GFX, which is equivalent to a 35 mm. And I try to find the perspective. So rather than using a zoom lens, uh, which, yes, you can include everything. But now I'm actually, I'm actually look, looking at subjects that interest me and try to compose it using. Um, that lens itself. So I actually walk a lot and trying to find, okay, example, I like this uh, thing very much. So yeah. I will just move around and then I will just make that shot. Yeah, with, with that with that one lens, yeah. Okay, I think I think uh, if I'm using the ST series, uh, okay, I'm very much a prime user kind of guy, unless, you know, I need to zoom, use zoom lenses and stuff like that. But 
if I'm talking about going to normal cities and stuff like that, I think I still like a 23 mm. I will I would like the uh, 23 mm uh, 1.4 instead of the f2, uh, mainly because of the extra stop that I have. And uh, to me, it's just something very versatile because, um, um, well, I can shoot a lot of things with the 23 mm, which I actually use a lot. And uh, of course, I also get. Uh, uh, what Joseph meant about having a 1635 and things like that because you know 23 mm also you know just in between, so um yeah it's something that I really love a lot and and I can actually get a lot of images with that lens and not conspicuous enough small enough with the SD3 and actually um um yeah manage uh, something that is very comfortable to me yeah if I'm on a GFS then maybe um I don't know. Uh, I use the one one zero a lot actually. Uh, it's wow, really that's a huge lens. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge lens, but it's one of the favorite. It's, it, it, yeah, it's but um, the quality is very good. The yeah, quality, the, the brocade it's, behind is like wow. Yeah, it's, it's very just very nice. That I, 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 I use it so much. Um, of course. Um, uh, again, depends on where I go. If I'm on a city, maybe I'll, I'll just bring a pancake lens, the fifty mm. But otherwise, uh, one one zero is something that I use a lot, even for landscapes. Uh, in fact, a lot of landscape photos I use uh, one one zero. Uh, people shots I use the one one zero. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm torn between the fifty mm and the one one zero actually. So that, that's for the GFS. But otherwise, the ST series, um, uh, twenty three mm is definitely the lens to go for for me. The one point four, yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, yep. Yeah. So I maybe we have time for one more question um let's see uh if uh, do, uh let's see. how do you sh when shooting scenes with people how do you approach the subjects and get the shots okay well okay communication basically so yeah so for me okay um also okay depends on which means that it's more on street photography so sometimes i actually shoot before i i talk to them <laughs> but sometimes i will talk to them before i shoot it, it really depends on the situation you 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 see so when i look at uh example in uh, holy itself so Okay, I wish I went to Holi Festival in, in uh, India. So India is very easy. You do not need to talk to them. They'll just <laughs> come to you. Please yeah. take me. No problem, please take me. Come. <laughs> so they'll just come to you, you see. So it's very easy that, uh, yeah, they will just come to you and ask you to take a picture. But the thing is that you do not want to take a picture of them because, uh, yeah, it's like oh, it's wasting right. your, yeah, yeah, all rubbish is yeah. it's, it's wasting your shot. So, but, well, so it really depends. But for me, uh, if let's say, example, I have a shot that I really like, I will just go to them and probably ask them to post a little bit or maybe be natural, like walk here and there. And or they just, hey, please continue, do your things. I'll just take a shot. So I, you need to actually talk to them before you actually uh, shoot them, okay? I mean, if you want to have a certain shot. But there are one situ there's one situation I always remember, remember Okay, that's in Kashmir. So I was in a market itself. So I was like, okay, shoot photography, it's just, I just shoot. So I was shooting, one lady was selling food or selling something. So I just go down and I just shoot. The lady chased after me. <laughs> <laughs> something like that, and then scold me. And then after she, uh, she used her hand and want to uh, take, I mean, slap my uh, hand yeah. and then, like want to grab my camera or something like that. Okay. And I really ran two streets and she really chased me for two streets. Wow. Yeah. So after that, I realized that, okay, well, it's a Muslim uh, culture. So they don't like uh, people to take shots of women. So mm -hmm. that's why mm -hmm. when we go there, I think that after this experience, we have to be very cautious about uh, the places that we go, whether yeah, uh, how the culture and uh, how would they respond to you. You see, so but I I really don't know because I thought that it's just street photography and they just take and just take a shot, you know, just somebody just selling uh, things, you know. So but the things that I didn't know that she chased me for two streets, you know. 
wow. for that. Yeah. So yeah. I really run for my life. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, for me, I, I guess um, in all my years as uh, 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 doing travel photography, there are two places that really uh, uh, are probably a bit you know hostile in, in photography. Uh, Morocco, Morocco and um, North Korea. So these are the two places where you know you really got to be very careful about yes. you know what you shoot and things like that. But fortunately, uh, in all these years as a travel photographer or even as a wedding photographer, uh, I, I I guess I've trained myself to be quite invisible. So a lot of times where I shoot people, which I have demonstrated to my participants before, um, uh, I see a particular scene, I can just shoot it and walk, walk away, and nobody would even notice that I took a shot. So I guess um, that is a skill set that I've you know acquired with throughout all these years, and thank God I have not been chased down the street by anybody before. Um, yeah, but those are, yeah, those are a lot of uh, 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 you know photos of people and things like that. Um, uh, sometimes when I stay with the uh, local families, like when I go to Mongolia, I stay with the nomads and things like that. Um, it's a lot of interaction with them. It's a lot of um, trust that they have in me that eventually, you know, you can get shots without having much of problems. They don't post for you. Um, they just carry on with their life and you just document them as it is, which I really enjoy a lot as well. So to, to answer that question, I think, I guess uh, most of the time I try not to ask for permission. I don't post people, but also um, if I'm staying with a family, if there's a mutual trust and things like that, uh, no, they don't even post for me. I just shoot and I get my images. Or if it's in the streets, if I'm shooting people in the streets, uh, I, I guess I managed to do it uh, in a way that, you know, I don't get into much trouble and, um, you know, people don't really take much notice of me. So, uh, uh, yeah, thank God for that. Uh, otherwise, um, um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Maybe we can have one more question. Uh, uh, this is definitely something very applicable to both of us. <laughs> That's why I wanted to ask the question. Is it better to go on solo trips or better to join travel in a group uh, with buddies or join a travel shop? <laughs> well, for me, it uh, really, really depends on the person itself. I mean, solo trip have a solo trip kind of... Um, advantage and yes, yeah. if let's say you join a workshop or even go with buddies you also have its own advantage as well so it really depends on what kind of things that uh what is what kind of photos or what kind of uh, experience that you want yeah so I, I like solo trip myself because i can do things that i want to do and uh nobody is just like beside me that is disturbing me so i can have that shot that i want but the thing is that i'm alone it's so sometimes when you want to go for to eat something, I say, ah, so I cannot order this whole feast, you know. I can only just order one bowl of noodle. So that is, I mean, the pro and cons, like, you know, get me? And the cost is going to be much more expensive, definitely. Yep. So, and you go with buddies, you sell buddies. Well, yes, it's one whole group of friends uh, together. Yes, it's very fun, enjoyable, definitely. But of course, when you should start, start to shoot, your buddy will also want to shoot. So everybody will be messed all together. Yes, if you get a shot, everybody is happy. But most of the time, uh, it will be very kind of like, um, how, how would I put it? It's like, well, if the body is quite okay, I would say that most of the time you will get that, that, that shots together. But if it's not, then you probably both of you won't get that shot. Yeah. So that is the thing because you cannot score your body, right? Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I would say just join travel workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Joseph or join myself. No, no, but of course, frankly to say, I've 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 went on road trips with a lot of people, like hundreds. I went on road trips with just alone, went on road trips with just like another person or whatever. All got its pros and cons, but ultimately it depends on your character and uh, see what uh, matters to you more. But uh, of course, in terms of safety, you know, especially when you're traveling, sometimes it's good to travel with a buddy because uh Sometimes you just have to leave a bag behind and go somewhere or whatever, I don't know, go toilet. You know, it's always good to have a buddy for just for safety. You know? Yeah. Uh, 
uh, that's, that's why when you join a photo tour itself or photo workshop, you your safety is our main concern. So we make sure that you you go there, you will come back safe. That is for me. My workshop is that you go there with me, you will be safe. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So yep. So uh, I think uh, we also overrun. <laughs> yes. Anyway, okay. I think I think uh, that's all we have for tonight. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for you know Joseph. Uh, uh, Fuji Film as well, and of course, uh, uh, for for having this uh, uh, live broadcast, and and uh, thanks to all the viewers who actually you know spend their Saturday nights uh, watching this uh, live broadcast of two two travel photographers, and uh, I hope you guys actually have some more insights about travel photography, and um, if you guys have a lot more questions on travel photography, I mean, our CB is until 1st of, uh, 1st of June, right? Yeah. So there's still a month to go, a month plus to go. If you guys want to have more of such things, whether is it me, Joseph, or any of the other ex photographers, do, you know, go to the Facebook, uh, 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 make some comments. Make some comments, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, Fuji from Singapore will actually read your comments and try to work out something. You know, uh, we are at this time of the year, this time of the, this time of, this, this period of time where we cannot go out uh, for workshop or anything like that. But um, we can always share our views online and um, uh, share a lot more things with you guys. But of course, we cannot do it for very long because I'm sure everybody got very short extension span. So sometimes you would want to listen for a long period of time so we cannot go on forever but uh, uh if there's interest uh we can always do a short one hour one half hour kind of thing and uh i hope it would be beneficial to you guys um and joseph any last comments well for me i think that um i got nothing much here and just support fuji film yeah <laughs> <laughs> and join our workshops yeah william and me Yep, and uh, we have our JMS hundred over here as well, Joseph. You have yours also. <laughs> oh yes, of course. Uh, this, uh, this one is time to uh, advertise, uh, basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. Before correct. we close it off, yeah. So yep. Uh, if you have not tried the JMS hundred, uh, try it soon once we are open. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yep. Thank you very much, and that's thank all you. Have. Right, and uh, thank you everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.